In this lesson, we will discuss four topics. The first one is the Voronoi diagram. The second one is the Delaunay triangulation, which is the most popular type of triangulation when we're dealing with terrains. The third topic, we will uh, look into the duality between the Voronoi diagram and the Delaunay triangulation. Uh, the duality means that uh, these two structures represent the same thing, just from a different point of view. And as a fourth topic, we will discuss how to construct a Delaunay triangulation and a Voronoi diagram. If we speak of a Voronoi diagram, we speak of a set of points. So let's say we have some uh, elevation points that were collected around. Uh, we start by um, projecting these points to the 2D plane, as we saw in previous uh, lesson. So if we have a set of points on the plane, for example, the around 25 points that we have here, then the Voronoi diagram creates, uh, well, if we explain it simply, proximity cells. So it means that uh, every point that we can call a generator creates one cell, as you can see here. So if we have 25 points, let's say now, then we have 25 cells, and each cell represents the space that is closer to the points generating the cells, or the point in the middle, let's say, than to any other points. So if we are here, if you look at the point P, for example, here, uh, we can say that all the points, so all the XY location that are within the cell that is uh, around the point P, are closer to P than to any other points. Let's see how we can create the Voronoi diagram for a few points. So if we start with one point only, let's say we have one generator, then uh, there's only one Voronoi cell and that Voronoi cell is unbounded. So its area is infinite, so it covers the whole plane. Then if we add a second point, for example that one, so we have now two generators. Um, how it works? Well, it's pretty simple. We can just look at the uh, line segment that connects the two points and then we find the uh, perpendicular bisector. So if we look in the middle of the line segment and we look at 90 degree, then we can simply draw the line segment that we call the uh, perpendicular bisector. And then if we remove uh, the line segment, then we obtain two cells. So we have one one cell that represents the space that is closer to the point on the left, and uh, the one on the right is, is also Voronoi cell. Now let's add a third point, a third generator. So let's say we add a point here. Then the same procedure can be followed. We find the bisector, uh, we find, we draw the uh, line segment that connect every pair of points. In that case, we have two because we already have one. And then we draw the uh, perpendicular bisector of all line segments. So here it would be around something like this. And we can remove the line segment that connects the two points. And we can also remove the parts that are not interesting for us. And then we obtain something like this. So it means that now we have, well, they go at infinity. We have three Voronoi cells that are all unbounded. Uh, and what you should notice if we look at some characteristics, so we know that if we walk along the line here in red, we also know that if we're here, then we're at the same distance from that point and that point. Notice also that if we stand here, the junction of the three Voronoi cell, uh, we know that we are exactly at the same distance from three points, that point, that point, and that point. And if we continue to walk along that line, so if we know that if we're here, then we're at the same distance from that generator and that generator. Since drawing by hand is not my forte, uh, we're going to use an application where we can insert uh, incrementally different points and reconstruct the Voronoi diagram at each step. So you can see here that each time we click, we insert a new point and then more or less the same steps that we've just seen are being done in the software and the Voronoi diagram is updated. A few things to notice about the Voronoi diagram. Uh, you notice that when we started, the cells were unbounded, but if you can see here, many of the cells are bounded. To know which one are bounded and unbounded, it's pretty well. If you can notice here, you can see that the blue ones, for example, that one, that one, and that one are bounded. 
but uh, this one, this one, and for example, that one are unbounded. So you can see that because that one, if you just continue the lines, they will never converge. But for example, that one would be bounded because if you just continue the line, so the Voronoi cell will go beyond the uh, arbitrary uh, rectangle that we have put as a uh, spatial extent, but this cell is bounded. So uh, the cells that are unbounded are this one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. So if you just join them, you obtain what we call the convex hull. The convex hull of a set of points is the smallest convex polygon containing all the points in the set. Consider the 14 points that we have here and imagine that for each of them we use a nail that we nail only halfway so that it's sticking out on a wooden table, for example. Then the convex hull can be represented uh, with an elastic band that we let go around the 14 nails. The shape that the elastic band will take will represent the outer boundary of the convex hull, which is a polygon. Given a set of points in the plane, instead of subdividing the plane into Voronoi cells, it's also possible to subdivide that plane into triangles, for example. Well, actually, we will not subdivide the whole plane uh, into triangles, but the convex hull of the set of points. So in the case of the set of points here, so what we can do is that we can subdivide its, con subdivide its convex hull into triangles. So one solution we can obtain is that one here. So we have a set of triangles, but uh, as you can notice, some of the triangles, so for example, that one here or um, that one here, are very long and very skinny. Uh, this is a property that's not desirable in terrain modeling. This is something that we will discuss in a future lesson. So what we do usually in terrain modeling is that uh, instead of using any triangulation, we use what it's called the Delaunay triangulation. So this is here the Delaunay triangulation. The one that I just showed wasn't a Delaunay triangulation. So a Delaunay triangulation has the unique property of having m of uh, having its triangle with an empty circumcircle. So it means that if we draw the circle around uh, each triangle this uh, circle will be empty of any other points. I'm not very good at drawing circle, but as you can see here, if we draw the circle around every triangle, then this uh, circle should be empty of any other point, any other generator. So if we go back to the previous one, you can easily see here that if I draw, for example, the circumcircle of the triangle here, would be this triangle here, then it will contain several points. Um, and that's the same for many others. If you do it here, for example, if you notice here, this one is very tiny. So if we try, try to draw the circle, it will be a massive circle that will contain several of the other points, for example, that one and that one. The Delaunay triangulation has a very interesting property, and this property is called the max-min property. And that says basically that the minimum interior angle of every triangle will be maximized. So this means that long and skinny triangles will be avoided. The maximum property and the empty circumcircle property can easily be explained if we consider four points forming a polygon like those. If we want to triangulate this polygon, then we have two choices. Either the diagonal is like this one or like that one. Let's start with the diagonal that is horizontal, then we obtain two triangles. And then if we draw the circumcircle around the triangle, which is at the top, then uh, the orange uh, circle, then you can see that the other opposite point is inside the circle, which means that it's not the lonely. And the same is true for the triangle, which is at the bottom in light gray. If we draw its circumcircle, then the point above is also inside the circumcircle. But if we draw the other diagonal, the, the vertical one, we also obtain two triangles. And then as you can see here, if we draw the circumcircle around each of these two triangles, then the circumcircle is empty. 
You can also notice that the interior angles of um, the triangles are larger when the uh, diagonal is vertical and not horizontal. There exists a duality between the Warner diagram and the Delaunay triangulation. Uh, the duality implies that these two structures represent the same thing just from a different point of view. And this duality also implies that uh, every element of the planar graph of the Warner diagram, so Warner diagram is formed of vertices, edges, and the embedding in the plane implies that we have faces. So every element of the Warner diagram has a direct correspondence to every element of the Delaunay triangulation, also if we look at it from a uh, planar graph point of view. And this correspondence is easily uh, explained. So we know that if we have a vertex in one graph, it's mapped to a face in the other one. We know that if we have an edge, it's mapped to an edge. And we know that if we have a face, it's mapped to a vertex. So uh, if we start with the Delaunay triangulation in the case, in uh, the Delaunay triangulation that we can see here, uh, and if we start with uh, this one, so if we say that we have faces and we try to map them, uh, not we try, but we map them to every face becomes a vertex. So if every face is a triangle, so we know that, for example, here I can say this triangle has is mapped to a vertex, this one as well, this one as well, this one as well, and this one as well. And uh, actually, I just put the points uh, in the more or less in the middle of every triangle, but I know from the definition of the Warner diagram and the Delaunay triangulation that the location of a point is actually defined as the center of the circumcircle of a triangle. So if I draw this, then I know where they can be located. Uh, notice that here my triangles are more or less equilateral, so there's no uh, so the point is located more or less in the middle, but if I looked at another uh, triangle, for example that one here at the bottom, if I draw the circumcircle, it's pretty big, and it's very much possible that the dual Voronoi vertex of this triangle here, it's possible in that case that it's located outside, but this is completely okay and this is not a problem. So now that we've done the faces to vertex, and we can look at the other part, which is mapping every edge of the Delaunay triangulation to an edge of the Voronoi diagram. So if we look at the edge here, we know. Uh, so it will be we know that it's going to be mapped to another edge, and then the other the other edge will simply be linking the two uh, center of the triangles that are incident to that one. That should be at 90 degree. It's not exactly, but you get the idea. And then if we do that for all of them, then we obtain the Voronoi cell for the uh, generator that we have here. And then we can continue to do it for other points. So for example, I could draw join that one, join that one here, this one here, and here. And then I would obtain the Voronoi cell for the point here. And then if I continue, then I joined in the same manner all the if I did the mapping for all the edges, then I would obtain the Voronoi diagram for the same set uh, of generators. So it's possible to go from the Delaunay triangulation to the Voronoi diagram this way, but it's also possible to go from the uh, Voronoi diagram to the Delaunay triangulation by applying the same uh, idea. As we've just seen, the Delaunay triangulation can always be extracted from the Voronoi diagram and vice versa. So it means that if we want to construct either structure, we can just construct one or the other and then extract the other one on the fly. In this lesson, we're focusing on algorithms to reconstruct the Delaunay triangulation. So if you can see the Voronoi diagram here, uh, sometimes it's displayed. So we display sometimes the Delaunay triangulation in the Voronoi diagram. But all the operations that we do to reconstruct the Voronoi diagram are actually performed only uh, on the triangle. So we're only dealing with triangles and we keep up to date the Delaunay triangulation. And only when it's time to draw the Voronoi diagram do we extract all the cells and edges from the Delaunay triangulation. Let's discuss one algorithm to reconstruct the Delaunay triangulation. It's called an incremental algorithm. An incremental algorithm means that um, we construct a Delaunay triangulation by starting with already a Delaunay triangulation. It can be a very simple one with three points. 
and then we incrementally, let's say we have 10 more points, we simply uh, update the Delaunay triangulation with a fourth point. So we insert it, we update the Delaunay triangulation, so we have a valid Delaunay triangulation, and then we insert a new one, the fifth one, we update it, and we continue. This is possible because of a property of the Delaunay triangulation that is given a Delaunay triangulation, it can always be updated and it can be updated locally. This is shown here. So let's say we have a Delaunay triangulation on the left and we have 12 points and then we would like to insert the point here in red. Uh, we can see here that uh, this, the insertion of that point will only affect a certain number of triangles in a Delaunay triangulation. And these triangles are shown in gray here. Uh, the insertion of that point will only invalidate a certain number of triangles and there's only four and these four triangles are the one in the red area here. Uh, this is based on the property of the Delaunay triangulation that says that the circumcircle of every triangle needs to be empty. So basically what we show here is that the insertion of the point here will uh, render on Delaunay four of the triangles in that uh, Delaunay triangulation. Um, so here we had only maybe around 15 points, but in theory, if we had several other triangulations, if we had a triangulation of a million around, then the insertion of, a, of this point would also create only, uh, would also delete only four triangles. So triangle one, two, three, four here would be deleted. The insertion of the point creates a polygon and it needs to be retriangulated. And the retriangulation creates here, as you can see on the right, six triangles that are all incident to the point P. We explain in details in the book how can a triangulation be updated after the insertion of a new point. The update is performed, as you can see here, by a sequence of operations that we call flips. And a flip is simply something that will change, actually flip the diagonal of pairs of adjacent triangles. So all the gray triangles that we've seen before that were problematic for the, uh, that were not Delaunay anymore, will be modified in a sequence of operations that we call flips.